Hello everyone, welcome to Gotham City Bible Study number 6. Today we'll be talking about Batgirl Year One and how the character of Batgirl, that, that is to say Barbara Gordon, illustrates what it means to be a saint. If you like what you hear on this channel, please like this video and subscribe. Now, on to the show. In the process of creating this podcast episode, it took me a little extra time to figure out how to properly analyze Batgirl Year One. This comic book, which provides what is easily the definitive retelling of how Barbara Gordon became Batgirl, is the first story I've looked at which is centered around a female character. I naturally, therefore, thought that a great comic book heroine might be comparable to a great woman of the Christian religion. An early candidate was the Virgin Mary, though I later thought that the Old Testament character of Ruth might be better. But as I gave more thought to Barbara's story as depicted in Batgirl Year One, I realized that I'd have to step away from the decisively ecumenical approach I've taken in previous videos and lean into my status as a member of the Roman Catholic Church. The reason for the shift in theological perspective which this episode contains is tied up in the distinctly Catholic concept of sainthood and how Batgirl is a Class A study in what it means to be a saint. Batgirl Year One was made by the same creative team which produced Robin Year One, with Chuck Dixon and his colleagues really nailing it in this 2003 comic book. It tells the story of how Barbara Gordon went from a computer-savvy martial arts enthusiast to an important superheroine who managed to gain the confidence and trust of even the notoriously unflappable Batman. Batgirl Year One sees Barbara successfully overcoming the obstacles which block her way to becoming a superhero, similar to how many saints had to overcome a long series of obstacles while striving to live holy lives. But more than what she actually does, the crux of the matter lies in why Barbara wants to do those things in the first place. The explanation she gives at the end of the series is deceptively simple, but it is one and the same as what I think motivated most of the saints. My study of this comic kind of made me reconsider my view of the saints. My view of such persons is chiefly shaped by the fact that I didn't grow up Catholic. The whole notion of le learning about the saints at all is still very alien to me, what with me having grown up as a Protestant. But thanks to a Eureka moment that I got when thinking about the content of this episode, I now understand much better why the reverent awe about the saints, well, saints which is taken for granted by lifelong Catholics, even exists at all. The origin story of Batgirl in Batgirl Year One can be read as an allegory of what it means to be a saint, with Barbara Gordon's transformation into the titular heroine paralleling the journey of many saints to beautification. Batgirl Year One is another tour de force by Chuck Dixon, who shares writing duties here with Scott Beatty. In this comic, Barbara Gordon, the young adult daughter of Commissioner Jim Gordon, really wants to follow in her beloved father's footsteps and become a police officer. Jim, understandably, doesn't want his little girl to risk her life in what he knows is a dangerous and demanding occupation and stonewalls her ambitions. Barbara's failure to end right around her father's wishes leads her to give her attention to her father's costumed allies, Batman and Robin. Barbara gets it into her head that maybe if she can't become a cop, she can become a superhero, and thus Batgirl is born. But Barbara's attempts to be a vigilante on a budget attract the attention of the dynamic duo, who are initially unimpressed and annoyed by her efforts. Batman in particular has little patience for a female counterpart who clearly has a more spirited and naive view of the life he leads. But Robin takes a shine to her, both collegially and romantically, leading, her to give her, leading him to give her a bit of help. After a few death-defying escapades, Barbara manages to gain Batman's respect and is duly inducted into the Bat family. This induction by Batgirl into that body marks the first time that an individual outside of Bruce Wayne's immediate circle joins him in his mission without his direct invitation. Even Dick Grayson had a front row seat to Batman in action as Bruce Wayne's ward. Batgirl had to lobby for her job. And she wouldn't be the last one to take that route into the Bat family, where Batman is the de facto patriarch of a larger network of masks of vigilantes in Gotham City. Writer Chuck Dixon has a knack for making the fundamentally ludicrous nature of superheroes seem plausible and realistic, while also retaining an aura of fun and adventure. Scenes such as the one where Barbara creates homemade crime-fighting gear from equipment she bought off the internet come to mind. Not all writers are able to success successfully pull off such a tone on a consistent, consistent basis, but Dixon's work on comics like Robin and Nightwing in the 1990s managed to tell stories which have one foot in reality and one foot in the fantasy world in a way which works, 
so too in this comic. The fact that Dixon is a solid writer of action-adventure sequences who knows how to productively collaborate with the artists he finds himself working with is another big part of what makes his comics great. Besides all of that, Dixon has no snobbish literary pretensions. He genuinely wants to tell a fun-filled romp of a story about cool heroes punching bad guys. But at the same time, Dixon refuses to insult the reader's intelligence and manages to spin yarns which can be enjoyed without turning your brain off. Batgirl Year One is just one more example of Chuck Dixon at the peak of his career as a bat scribe. I'm pretty sure that Dixon didn't intend for Batgirl Year One to be interpreted as having any deeper meaning in and of itself. But like all good stories, this comic can be used to illustrate a profound truth. Batgirl's quest to become a superhero with Batman's blessing is reminiscent of the lives of many saints. Plenty of saints have faced, ups, faced obstruction by family, friends, and even the church itself in their respective quests to live lives of heroic virtue and holiness. A classic example is that of St. Francis of Assisi, who shocked and amazed everyone around him when he abandoned the wealthy, privileged life he'd been born into. Rather, St. Francis radically altered how he lived, distributing every bit of money he had to the poor, even to the point of giving away all of his clothes to those who were less fortunate than themselves, himself. St. Francis' deeds attracted followers who formed the Poor Friars, an order of monks dedicated to living lives of poverty and piety. St. Francis' actions did not go unnoticed by the church, who at various points had reacted by attempting to rein in the enthusiastic, seemingly madcap young man. But St. Francis' unflinching, single-minded desire to live a life of extreme holiness eventually won over the stodgy clerical establishments of his day, which is why he was beautified as a saint shortly after his death. This same type of drive to live a life of virtue to a heroic, intense degree can be found in the story of Batgirl. From the beginning, Barbara Gordon wanted to be a public servant, hoping to use her talents to help improve the world around her. When she was stopped by her father from becoming a cop, she took a more unorthodox route by becoming a superhero. When Batman and Robin tried to stop her from doing that, she only tried harder. Over time, the Cape Crusader and the Boy Wonder couldn't help but admire her tenacity and courage. Upon seeing that she was both very good at being a superhero and that she would never stop trying to be one, they brought her into the fold, and the rest is history. Beyond her almost literally superhuman deeds, Barbara's motivation for doing what she does in this comic is quietly revolutionary just by itself. Early in the series, Barbara is put on the spot by Batman when he asks her just why she wants to be a superhero at all. Hardcore Batman fans will know that Bruce Wayne's dedication to his mission is driven by an almost pathological desire to avenge the death of his, deaths of his murdered parents by spending the rest of his life fighting crime against crime and corruption. Barbara, meanwhile, doesn't have that type of motivating tragedy. She doesn't have the kind of emotional, psychological investment in superheroing which Batman does. The result is that when Batman initially poses this question to her, she can't help but be totally surprised and speechless. Batman's lack of sympathy for her desire to become a superhero is rooted in his totally different understanding of what he does, an understanding which Barbara cannot even begin to comprehend. But in the concluding issue of the series, after Barbara has been given more room to grow as a hero, she is able to give an answer to Batman's question. When given a second chance to tell Batman why she wants to be a superhero, Batgirl simply says, Because I can. These three simple words, because I can, actually sum up the motivation for a lot of classic superheroes who aren't Batman, including figures as venerable as Superman and Wonder Woman. The typical motivation for superheroes in the early days of comic books featuring that sort of character was often quite uniform, almost all usually following the model set by Superman. The origin of most early superheroes in the golden age of comics in the 1940s featured a well-off individual with a glamorous occupation, almost always someone who was already a square-jawed alpha male. This person would immediately decide to use their newly acquired powers or abilities to fight for truth and justice as a costumed adventurer because they could. The comic reading public's fatigue with the Superman model is part of the reason why the tragic, more neurotic characters produced by Marvel comics, such as Spider-Man and the X-Men, became so popular so quickly. But Barbara's terse, straightforward explanation for why she wants to be a superhero is very much a back-to-basics affair. 
She wants to do good because she thinks that such a thing is worth doing by itself, in the same manner that a scholar might want to learn and acquire knowledge for its own sake. The fact that her father, super cop Jim Gordon, essentially operates by the same philosophy probably explains a lot. The assumption made by both the creators of the Golden Age superheroes and by Dixon and Company in 2003 is that heroism is the default, not the opposite. The operating idea of these stories is that the natural, logical thing to do when given the ability to do extraordinary things is to use those abilities for good. The Marvel method of creating heroes with flaws and insecurities was new and original, in part because it produced superheroes who actively tried to rebel against this assumption, almost always unsuccessfully and to dramatic effect. In the case of Barbara Gordon, when she says that she wants to be a superhero and fight crime because she is capable of doing so and wants to do so, she is actually hearkening back to the earliest days of superhero stories. She is, in effect, appealing to first principles. But what does all this have to do with Catholic saints? Plenty. The point of sainthood in Catholicism is that there are certain individuals who are so holy and so heroic that in their efforts to live lives of virtue and piety, they ought to be revered as special figures within the larger faith tradition. For the Protestants in the audience, I don't want to get into the weeds of trying to explain why Catholics feel this way about saints, and I don't want to get bogged down in an argument about the theological soundness of this custom. Such a discussion is beyond the scope of this video, and frankly above my pay grade to conduct. I do, however, want to shed some light on how the story of Batgirl plays into the story of a lot of saints. Barbara tells Batman that she wants to be a superhero and to do good for its own sake. She tells him that she wants to risk her life and put aside her own well-being in order to adopt a lifestyle of extreme virtue, all because she thinks that doing so is worthwhile by itself. What I mean to say here, hopefully without cheapening the concept in the minds of some listeners, is that the motivation of a saint is typically one and the same as the motivation for a classic old school superhero. That, motion, that motivation being the desire on the part of said saint to live a life of extreme holiness all because they can. Just like saintly figures from Abel to Mother Teresa endured great privations and made great sacrifices to live lives of godliness for the sake of godliness, so too do classic heroes in the vein of Superman do the same thing, fighting for truth and justice for the sake of truth and justice. Batgirl is a more humble, human example of a superhero in that vein, and the story related in Batgirl Year One contains an understated degree of depth in that regard. This is the Eureka moment I mentioned earlier. This is what popped into my head as I was thinking about how to approach Batgirl Year One. This idea that superheroes, particularly classic superheroes, are analogous to saints is what made it possible for me to conduct this study at all. To summarize, this Batgirl origin story is an amazing comic book. It represents a solid example of what writers and artists from a bygone generation were capable of creating. At just short of 20 years old, it has passed the test of time and remains worth reading today. In terms of what it can illustrate on a spiritual level, the story of Barbara Gordon strongly parallels the lives of many saints, both famous and obscure. Like Barbara, these holy men and women lived lives of radical virtue, which for them took the form of all-consuming piety, charity, and self-denial. Barbara's journey to becoming a superhero may be a bit more flamboyant and outlandish than the biographies of even the most colorful of the saints, but the similarities are still there. On a more nuanced level, Barbara's uncomplicated, no-nonsense justification for wanting to be a superhero says volumes about what drives a lot of saints. Just like Batgirl only wants to do what a superhero does for its own sake, saints have one concern and one concern only, to be godly for the sake of being godly. On a basic level, such a philosophy is what defined the first and greatest superheroes, and which continues to define them in their best stories. As mentioned previously, Batgirl Year One is probably not meant to communicate an explicit philosophical or moral truth. But the story of Barbara Gordon can still function as a model of the idea of sainthood, with Barbara's story reflecting how many saints become, became saints at all. The attitude which all saints must possess is summed up in a quotation from St. Paul the Apostle in the second epistle to Timothy. In that letter, Paul is writing his final message to his protege and surrogate son, a young pastor named Timothy. When Paul wrote this letter, he was awaiting execution during the Roman Emperor Nero's campaign of terror against the early Christians. As he sat in prison, Paul wrote a set of words which, in one form or another, sums up the driving rationale which all saints have. 
In 2 Timothy 4.8, St. Paul wrote, From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Batgirl may have been questing for a cape and cowl rather than a crown of righteousness, but all the same, she provides a titanic example to everyone who wants to know just what kind of mindset goes into requiring sainthood. Not everyone can become such a saint, but anyone can do what they can where they are to live a saintly life. It's all a matter of choosing to answer God's call to do so. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Gotham City Bible Study. And if you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. Thank you very much.